Hello hackers, welcome to yet another awesome lecture, hopefully, I mean, maybe it'll be awesome. Um, in the dynamic allocator misuse module today, we're talking about heap metadata corruption. You've learned about heap metadata. You've seen um, ways that some mild corruption in Tcash can um, lead to problems. Um, we aren't going to dig so deep into insane, crazy, subtle corruption techniques. I'll give you an overview in this video of other types of metadata corruption, historical and present. And uh, then we'll wrap it up and you will tackle the awesome, uh, hopefully awesome challenge problems we prepared for you, for you to learn about heap misuse. All right, let's roll. Um, so let's think about the goals of an attacker when they are corrupting heap metadata. Um, generally, uh, an attacker corrupts heap metadata to either modify arbitrary memory, like uh, abuse the heap, fool the heap into modifying some memory, thinking that it is some uh, other part of heap metadata. You can imagine um, doing something like that with uh, injective, with modifying that next pointer in Tcash, as we discussed in the Tcash lecture, um, or more generally, much more um, frequently, trying to achieve what is called an overlapping allocation. So you do something to the heap and it gets confused and either returns the same pointer twice or returns um, one allocation that is actually inside another allocation or returns an allocation that actually points to the stack. All of this is possible. Um, and if you actually saw um, the scenario of returning the same allocation twice, again, at that Tcash lecture um, where we abused the double free. Um, all right, and basically the idea is, of course, neither of these typically give you immediate control, but they allow you to further break the program's environment. And as you further control, if you, you create, uh, achieve more and more control over a program's internal state, you can slowly begin to puppet it um, and get it to do what you want it to do. Um, all right, so um, let's roll again. Uh, mostly historic and in large part historic. We'll start with something called the unlink attack. Um, recall the doubly linked list um, chunk metadata from the previous um, uh, video. I'm going to turn off my video for this one because it overlaps the text. All right. Um, recall that each, the doubly linked list has forward and backwards pointers. Uh, and when you are removing a uh, chunk from a doubly linked list, for example, from a large bin, you will look at the chunk forward of the previous chunk and you will set its back address to the chunk behind your chunk and you will set your, uh, the forward address of the chunk behind your chunk to the chunk in front of your chunk. Uh, this is better actually shown than described. Let me show it to you. All right, consider this uh, scenario where um, we have three allocations. Um, we have a chunk A, chunk B, and chunk C. I just um, displayed the forward and back pointers here. Um, and uh, the doubly linked list goes chunk A, then chunk B, then chunk C, and we want to remove chunk B. How do we do that? Of course, we um, start with chunk B, we look at what is ahead, and we say, okay, we take what's ahead, we take what's behind, and we just hook them up. Boom. And chunk B has been removed from the list using these two um, uh, memory operations. Chunk forward backwards equals chunk backwards, and chunk backwards forwards equals chunk forwards. Obviously, you can see if we overwrite the uh, memory or the, the values of chunk forward and chunk backward or the forwards and backwards um, pointers of one of the adjacent chunks that, that you know, it is um, uh, removing itself from, we can control the target of these memory write operations. Um, 
This used to be an extremely powerful and extremely common attack. Um, extra checks in libc. This is an example of that cyclic um, pattern of um, security and performance. Extra checks have been added to make sure that the um, chunk list makes sense. The part of the list that you're operating on, um, th that all of the um, that the next chunk is pointing back at you, and the previous chunk is pointing forward at you. You being the chunk that is being removed um, to try to fix these uh, sort of uh, problems. However, you can still pass these checks in certain scenarios. Um, I'll have a link to um, Shellfish's how to keep example repository later. Um, and I think I mentioned in a previous video, um, over in that repository, they have an example of a modern attack that, that can bypass some of these defenses. Um, all right, so that's a historical attack, one historical attack. Another historical attack is a really uh, neat um, uh, heap flaw uh, e exploitation called the poison null bite, right? So the, the question is, what if all you have is a um, kind of a string termination error or something, you know, an off by one null byte. This happens, um, not like an insane amount, but it does happen uh, quite a decent amount. It was actually, this technique was actually developed based on a real situation. Um, uh, if I remember correctly, it was first popularized by Google Project Zero, but don't quote me on that. That's just floating to, to my mind. Um, so what if you have something like this, where you have a single byte, um, uh, null byte overwrite, um, and that is it. So what is the problem here? The problem actually is that my slide is incorrect. One second, let me fix it real quick. All right, what changed? Well, what changed was that I changed the malloc OX1000 to malloc OX1008. Why? I did this because um, if you recall, from the previous lecture when the uh, that extra eight bytes is going to be the reuse of the previous chunk of the next chunks previous size since our current chunk is in use the next chunks previous size is actually there for us to use as extra uh, memory um, and so when we have this one byte overflow what we're actually overflowing with a null byte is um, the size value of the next chunk and that is where the weakness happens this is a, a graph from an explanation of this attack um and i'll try to follow this as as uh, well as i can it's it's historical um so it it uh you know has now been patched in libc um there was a uh, quite a lot of i think actually there are interesting ways to still bypass that patch and um let me move my video so you can see the figure source um, to bypass that patch and to uh, still carry out this attack. But but for the purposes of our module, I'll be talking about the historical attack without any checks to prevent it. Um, basically, imagine you have three allocations right up against each other um, and you free the middle one. Right. So, so the, the, the middle allocation is now a free chunk. It still has a size, and that size is OX208. And you overflow into that chunk, right, with your null byte. And you overwrite OX208 because it's a little endian to OX200, right? An interesting thing that happens is that when, uh, so B is free, that means C is previous size is being used, if you recall from the previous uh, video. When you allocate more, um, create more allocations to fill up B part by part, you make small allocations, C's previous um, size should be updated. But because B's size is too small, what is actually updated is some data right here, right before C's previous size. So C is constantly saying, hey, behind me, there is a um, size OX208 free chunk, right? When you free one of these, uh, the first uh, filler allocation chunk, 
it um, um, gets if when you so you free the 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 this uh, allocation chunk the the um, filler B and then you free C and when C is freed it says hey is the chunk behind me free and if the chunk behind it is free it consolidates it merges the chunk behind it and the chunk and and itself and adds that to the unsorted bin as a consolidated free chunk. And in this process, we forget all about the old allocation B. That is still a valid allocation, but the heap has forgotten about it. And next time something is allocated, it will get allocated over B, right? So this is an awesome attack. Um, I think there are still bypasses of checks against this um, uh, attack. Like I said, there's a colorful history of patches being written, argued over for a long time, and the mailing list of, of libc merged, immediately bypassed, uh, repatched, etc., etc., etc. Very fun uh, sort of uh, historical uh, oddity. Um, all right. Let's talk about my favorite um, heap uh, technique, the House of Force. It is also now patched, unfortunately, um, but there used to be a time when you could corrupt the size of the wilderness. Recall the wilderness from last lecture. It just says how many bytes are there left in the heap. If you allocate more than that, then it'll uh, use break to... Uh, um, expand the memory or it'll give you a, an M mapped piece of memory instead. But it used to be that you could simply overwrite that wilderness with a ginormous number. In fact, a negative number, right? In two's complement. So that when you, and then you could allocate that much memory, allocate, so that the heap got confused and went all the way around and you could allocate previous, um, your, your next allocation would be earlier in the heap. Or you could allocate so many, uh, so much memory if you knew where the stack and the heap both were that you could then allocate chunks onto the, the stack. This was very cool. Um, I, I really enjoyed using this technique, but unfortunately, or fortunately for security, it got patched. All right, let's find one that is not patched, that is still a, a very relevant extant technique. The House of Spirit. If you um, have a very good memory, you'll recall that this is one of the original houses that were... Um, uh, proposed by Phantasmal Phantasmagory or described by them um, in their uh, SecDev post that, that kind of created this lore of House of Blah for um, heap techniques. The, the, the idea is very simple, right? Um, turns out there are very few checks done at free time. And uh, this is actually still the case. This was the case uh, 15 years ago, still happening. Um, so what you can do is if you can control the pointer that is passed into a free and you can point it as some memory that you fully control, you can make that memory look like a chunk and free it and basically inject it into um, the, 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 in this case, into Tcash. It used to be into a fast bin or whatnot, but now you can inject it into Tcash and later when it is malloced back in, or then at the next malloc for the appropriate size, that your chunk, your free chunk will be returned, um, which is super exciting. And I will show it to you right now. <coughs> All right, so I, I um, wrote it up. So here's our, our chunk metadata. You know, I just, just created a, a struct so that I could easily allocated on the stack. So this is our stack chunk that, that's on the stack. So we malloc something that is uh, 16 um, bytes. And before we do the poison, I'll show you that that is, returns on the heap. And then we do this amazing thing. We say, okay, um, the we, we set up the chunk properly. We say that there's, you know, whatever, previous size zero, um, actually this probably should have been a little more proper and this should have been, uh, two, one for previous chunk in use, but it turns out that's not so important. Um, we basically say, uh, that there is a 
we create a chunk with a size of hex 20. That is, of course, an allocation of 16 plus um, 16 more for the metadata results in a chunk size of hex 20. And then we free it. And we free it, actually, um, we free it at this address, right? If you recall, the chunk is two keywords before your uh, memory location. So we need to free this memory location. Um, and then the next time we malloc, we get our chunk back. So let's compile that. Run it. Boom. First uh, allocation. Another allocation just to, to get keep things in. So this is uh, that first allocation that we made on the heap right here. And then after we poison the cache right here, you can see that the next allocation returns a stack address. Right now, I'm sure I don't need to tell you how brutal an overlapping address onto the stack can be. Depends on how the program uses um, this address, but if you, for example, if it was a name field that you could just write arbitrarily, you could use this to then override the stack, uh, uh, override the stack frame, overflow the return address, and take control of the program. Um, this is a very uh, powerful technique uh, it, with the right circumstances. If you can control this pointer that you inject into free and point it somewhere at data that you control, you're good to go. All right. Oops. Um, one second, technical issues. All right. Um, so a couple of miscellaneous um, tidbits I'll leave you with. One is uh, sometimes you're in a situation where you need to trigger a malloc, but the program just doesn't have a malloc for you to easily trigger. You usually um, do these things, uh, trigger heap functionality by by kind of puppeting the, the program, carefully um, triggering functionality within that program to get it to do, to do the heap operations you want done. Sometimes a malloc is hard to trigger. Well, it turns out that some libc functionality or other functionality internally will use a malloc. So if you can trigger a printf, and, and pass it a large enough string, it will allocate a buffer using malloc. Same with scanf. Um, with the right setup, uh, if you, for example, set up an overlapping, if you poison the, the, the um, uh, tcache, for example, using house of spirit with a um, chunk on the stack, and then you call scanf, and that uh, malloc's and starts writing to a buffer or printf, uh, will do the same thing. You can directly cause a uh, stack buffer overflow just with that printf, uh, which is super, super cool to see. Um, one caveat, sometimes you're using printf for debugging and you don't want it to um, create, uh, <laughs> to malloc stuff. So you can disable that behavior by disabling libc's internal buffers with these commands or these functions. All right, um, final note, I mentioned uh, this sort of tricking, puppeting the program to do what you want it to do to make the, uh, call the heap operations that you want it to call. Um, this is very hard and you will find out how hard it, it really is in the homework. Um, heap exploitation requires extremely precise heap layout. There is automation being done in this area uh, for example, recent uh, publications um, on techniques that will automatically do what is called heap massaging, massage your heap into the right place. Um, but mastering this is not easy. Um, but you will become masters at it and you'll use it to get flags. Good luck.